Welcome to the deep dive, everybody. Today we're diving into uh, we're going to be looking at the Book of Enoch. Yeah. Now I know you're thinking. Buckle up. This is not Sunday school. Right. We are going deep into Enoch's dream visions. Yes. Chapters eighty three through ninety. Dreams about showing up to work naked. Exactly. If your workplace involves collapsing heavens and uh, hybrid animals, hybrid animals, yeah, we're using scholar R. H. Charles's translation, uh, early 1900s. Now, this book, just so you know, is considered apocryphal, mm -hmm. meaning some groups include it in their scriptures, some don't. That's right. It's kind of like a uh, it's like an ancient treasure map. You know, <laughs> we got these clues, but to really uh, decipher them, we got to do a little bit of digging. I like that. And uh, in this case, we're going back centuries before. The Common Era. All right, so let's get into it. Chapter 83. Enoch starts with a nightmare. Heavens are crumbling, earth splitting open. Yikes. Not a good way to start your day or your dream, I guess. <laughs> right. He but runs to Grandpa, Mahalalel. Wise, wise sage of the family. The OG. And Mahalalel, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He's like, Enoch, this is a prediction. The earth is going to be destroyed because of humanity's sin. Heavy stuff. It is heavy, yeah. But here's what I find interesting. Enoch, instead of panicking, he immediately prays for the righteous. Hmm. It's like he's clinging to hope amidst the chaos. Well, that kind of sets the stage, <laughs> you know, for the visions to come, right? Because thought. you have this tension between judgment, but also the potential for redemption. Right. Okay, so chapter 84, this is where it gets yeah. a little strange. We get bulls. Buckle up. White bulls, black bulls. There we go. And a red bull that gets attacked. It's like a cosmic bullfight is happening. Yeah. Now think about, just for a second, what those colors meant, you know, in ancient cultures, right? Yeah. White often represented purity. Right. Black symbolized darkness, evil. Mm -hmm. And we even still have those associations today. Absolutely. Yeah. So are these bulls, like, are they something more than just bulls, you think? They're more than meets the eye. Right. They could be different forces at play, angels, rulers, maybe, <laughs> with, like, opposing agendas. Okay. Yeah. And they're using these animal images to help us grasp these complex, like, spiritual concepts. Right. And remember, this is a time when the line between the physical world and the spiritual world. Yeah. It was a lot more blurry. Right, right. A lot more blurry. And that Red Bull that gets attacked, what's the deal with that? <laughs> I know. Could be hinting at conflict. Maybe even sacrifice. It's like this dream is saying, like, hey, pay attention. This clash, this has consequences. Yeah. And it gets even wilder. Oh, boy. Chapters 86 and 87. All right, hit me. We're talking stars falling from the sky, animals interbreeding in really strange ways. Mm. And this, like widespread fear that's yeah. just gripping the earth yeah. feels apocalyptic. It does, okay. yeah. And this time it's not just like earthly chaos. It's not. It's like the celestial beings are like, hold my beer. <laughs> we're getting in on the action. They're entering the picture and they're like directly influencing stuff on earth. Oh. And this idea that the heavens are directly impacting our world that was central to their cosmology, like how they understood the universe. So, like, their entire worldview was, like, built around what was happening in the stars and the planets above. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And notice Enoch isn't just watching from afar anymore. Oh, he is more than an observer at this point. He's whisked away. What? By these mysterious figures in white up to this high tower. Okay, so he's got the best seat in the house to this cosmic chaos. Front row seat. What do you think is the significance of that change in his perspective? I think it's showing he's chosen, like he's elevated okay. to this place of greater understanding. Yeah. Whatever's coming next. Yeah. It's a big deal, not just for him, for everybody. So Enoch's chilling in this tower. Yeah. Cosmic chaos is unfolding. Like he's watching some bizarre movie. And what a movie it is. Seriously. Chapters 88 and 89. Him we are talking... Judgment and the Aftermath. Okay. Remember those fallen stars? The ones <laughs> causing all the trouble? Yeah. Enoch sees them get punished. Yeah. Cast into this dark abyss. <laughs> and then. And then. A flood engulfs the whole corrupted animal world. Okay, hold on. Hold on. What is it? This flood, is this like the same flood we hear about in other stories, other texts? It's hard not to see the parallels. Right, yeah. Both stories paint this picture. Yeah. Of a world that needs a total reset. Yeah, yeah. But here's where it gets really wild. Yeah. You remember that white bull? The one that got attacked. No, 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 the other one. Oh, oh, right. The one that seemed to represent, like, purity, goodness. Yeah, like a, uh, what's it called? Like a, a symbol of something. Exactly. Right. So this bull yeah. 
it undergoes this crazy transformation. What do you mean? It becomes a man. Get out of here. Builds this giant vessel. No way. And survives the flood alongside three other bulls. Hold on, so it's like a like a symbolic arc? Almost like it, right. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, so we got a flood, but with a bull turned man as as the savior, the hero. This is where I get lost. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. Who asked this guy? This bull man. Big question. Yeah. And a lot of debate around it, understandably. Mm -hmm. I bet. Some scholars connect him to messianic prophecies, you know, right. like a savior who emerges from chaos. Okay. Others see him as a representation of the righteous, those who make it through the judgment. It's like a symbol of hope, kind of. Exactly, exactly. Man, these ancient texts, they really know how to keep you guessing. They do, they do. Speaking of guessing, chapter 90. Oh, yeah. Throws us a curveball. It does. We got sheep now. Sheep? Eep. Instead of bulls. Right, and these sheep. Okay. They represent the righteous, the good guys. So far, so good. But there's always a but. They're constantly being led astray by their shepherds. Shepherds? I thought shepherds were supposed to, like, protect the sheep. You'd think so, right? Yeah. And they're being preyed upon by wild beasts on top of that? Hold on, hold on. What is it? If the sheep are the good guys, who are these shepherds? They sound kind of shady. Yeah, it's a tragic image. It is. The shepherds, they probably symbolize those in power, right? right? Rulers, leaders, anyone who's supposed to be guiding others. But they're not. Not quite. They're doing the opposite. They're exploiting them, letting them get picked off by the forces of evil, those wild beasts. That's messed up. It is. And what's worse, what? this isn't a one-time thing. What do you mean? Enoch, he sees this happening over and over, no. generation after generation of sheep suffering the same fate. That's rough. You can practically feel... His grief, like his frustration with the whole thing. Exactly. Like, come on, haven't we learned anything? That repetition, I think, hammers home a point. What's that? This constant struggle, good versus evil, righteousness battling corruption. Man, some things never change, huh? It's a pattern throughout history, isn't it? Yeah. Leaders failing their people, the innocent caught in the middle. Makes you wonder if we're ever going to break free from that cycle. It's a good question, big question. It is. But even with all this darkness, yeah. there's that glimmer of hope, right? There is. That one sheep that got away from the wolves. Oh, you remember that? Yeah, it stuck with me. That sheep, it cries out to the Lord for help. And? And that's when things shift. We see divine intervention. <laughs> yeah. The Lord steps in, rescues the flock. So even when it seems like all hope is lost. Even then. There's a chance for rescue, for justice. Precisely. <laughs> Speaks to the power of prayer, you know. Mm -hmm. That hope that someone's listening when we need it most. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. And it doesn't end there. Oh. Those responsible for the suffering. Yeah. They're held accountable. Good. What happens to them? And there's this new house built, a place for the righteous. It's like a, what do you call it, a do-over? Like? Hitting the reset button. Kind of, yeah. There's this feeling of renewal, of justice being served. I like it. But with all this symbolism, this ancient way of thinking, how do we apply this to our lives, you know? Like, it's one thing to talk about sheep and shepherds, but... You're hitting on a key point. Which is? We can't take these visions literally. Okay. They were never meant to be history books or science projects. Right, right. They were designed to get at something deeper, something true about us, about how we relate to the divine, to each other. So how do we bridge that gap? Yeah. Make these ancient stories relevant today? It's about finding those echoes, those themes that still resonate. Okay, give me an example. Corruption, unchecked power. Yeah. The choices we make when things get tough, those are things we still deal with, right? Yeah, for sure. So even if the players change. Instead of bulls and sheep, it's like, I don't know, politicians and corporations. Exactly. Okay, so you're saying. The core struggles, they stay the same. And by understanding these ancient texts, it's like we get a new perspective on our own world, our own lives. Exactly. It's a new lens to view those age-old struggles through. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, you know? Like, we're talking about stuff written thousands of years ago. I know, right? But these themes, leadership, sin, that struggle to be good, it's all still so relevant. It's like they tapped into something timeless. Totally. And it's not like they sugarcoated anything either, you know? I mean, c collapsing heavens, those sheep getting picked off. It's brutal. It is. But there's that thread of hope, too. Always. The people in charge, the ones abusing their power, they don't get away with it. There's a reckoning. Right. It's like a reminder that our actions actually matter. Our choices have consequences, for sure. 
And it's not just about the big guys, right? It's like each person oh, has correct. to decide which side they're on, the righteous or the, I don't know, the not so righteous. We're not just watching the story unfold. We're in it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's like Enoch's story is kind of our story too, you know? Exactly. It's a reflection. And in a world where things feel kind of crazy sometimes. It can. It's easy to forget that we have a say in how it all goes down. But we do. We have that power, that choice. Yeah, that's powerful stuff. It really makes you think, like, what can we actually learn from all this, from okay. these visions, you know? How do we take that ancient wisdom and actually use it? Big question. It is, right? It's not like the Book of Enoch gives you a step-by-step -step guide to being a good person. No, no instruction manual here. But it does make you stop and think, like, what kind of world do we want to create? And what role are we going to play in that? That's the question, isn't it? It is. It always is. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the Book of Enoch. It's been a wild ride. It has. But hey, that's what we're here for, right? To explore those weird, thought-provoking corners of history. Exactly. Those hidden gems. Exactly. And who knows? Maybe by digging into the past, yeah. we can find a little bit of guidance for the present. And maybe even the future. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on The Deep Dive. Take care, folks.